So guys, The Last of Us Episode 3. Boy, oh my boy. That, 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 I think that hit pretty hard. But also, th this episode takes quite a bit of a walk down another road than putting Joel and Ellie in, in the main spotlight. Granted that we did have them right at the beginning and we exited with them. This is because episode three, as many of you knew and were looking forward to, focuses mainly on Bill and Frank's relationship. And, and interestingly, as they said in the behind the scenes, and if you know the game anyways, one of the biggest departures from that of The Last of Us. But what was also interesting to factor in, and it's gotta be uh, fascinating to read your guys' comments on what Neil Druckmann thought here. He said that his philosophy with the show has always been about, you know, when we should deviate or when we should come back. So if it's kind of the same or worse, then we stay where the game is. But if it's better, we deviate. And that's something I do agree with, with adaptations in general. First and foremost, there is nothing wrong with innovation in shows, so long as it doesn't significantly alter the plot in a way that, all while this did significantly alter Bill and Frank's relationship, if it doesn't have ripple effects out into the plot in terms of like five hours from now and Joel and Ellie's adventure, this Bill and Frank change, still drastically changes that, then that would be a deviation I, I think uh, would matter. But when you change plots, for meaningful storytelling like this, that is an opportunity that you should seize if thought out well. And in, in this, they most certainly did that because the Bill and Frank in the game, as we're gonna get into with a couple of the changes here, are actually massive. A lot of it is similar with Bill and what the ultimate outcome is with the, the truck battery, for example, with Joel and Ellie at the end of this episode. But the relationship between Bill and Frank in the game versus that of the show is uh, quite different. So let's recap the events of the episode, get into some of the changes, and uh, just overall talk about The Last of Us Episode 3. And I have to say, the performances by Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett was just wow. Really, really well done. Nick Offerman is literally, I would say, quintessential Bill. Whereas with Murray Barlett's Frank, we actually don't really see him in the game. He's obviously spoken about, we find out what happened to him and actually how he feels about Bill and more on that a little bit later. So that gave a lot of room to really, really innovate and uh, capture something quite fresh in the live action adaptation. So at the beginning, we pick up with Joel and this is more or less very soon after they left the old state building and Tess obviously blew the living crap out of it. We do get some Ellie and Joel scenes in the woods. I would say some of the dialogue that we get here or even in the house later on with Bill and Frank, obviously it's ordered a little bit differently. Although the dialogue, once again, whether that's in Bill and Frank's house later between Joel and Ellie is almost word for word at times. I see some people complain about this, but to me it's kind of hard to understand with how accurate this show is and when you're adapting it to live action there's obviously some changes and none that as i said and i mentioned with those ripple effects that really knock on the main plot in a negative way also just with the larger events that are different with for example fedra in the game having chased joel ellie and tess to the old state building and then even after that through the old abandoned subway and how that leads into joel and ellie's encounter with bill there's differences here. Fedra aren't really chasing them anymore, so that allows for some new opportunity uh, through what we see in these beginning scenes in this episode. At this point in time, as you can really tell, Joel is still very cold with Ellie, and I think Ellie in this moment feels as though maybe it's just going to get worse, or, you know, the coldness is going to compound on top of one another with what Joel was already like, but with now Tess passing away due to this mission of even taking Ellie, Ellie says nobody made you and Tess agree to take me. You wanted the truck battery, so don't blame me for something that isn't my fault. And I think he kind of did need to hear that because if he's already being a bit harsh to her, the last thing they need with this atmosphere is, is Joel just looking at Ellie and saying, well, if we weren't taking you, Tess would probably still be here. But that's one of the beautiful aspects of The Last of Us with what journey we're seeing here. We're going to see Joel grow closer to Ellie despite being so closed off. Obviously, he was insanely closed off for the past 20 years, not only has he done terrible things, that even pushed his brother Tommy away, and we're gonna get some more insight on that. You can bet your ass later on in this show, maybe even with flashbacks to what actually Tommy couldn't hack doing with Joel in those years in between in order to survive. But now we saw Joel fairly closed off even with Tess. Like we had some dialogue that inferred that Tess felt a little bit more about Joel than Joel felt about her. 
But there was still obviously that connection there. But now Tess has passed away. With what words Bill put in that letter to Joel at the end, I would say that's almost a catalyst other than what Tess said with regards to, you know, keep her alive, save who you can save. That letter and just coming full circle to what we're even talking about with Joel here, seeing, starting to see the cracks in him, not necessarily starting to fully care, but instigating this really good way of carving out that story for Joel's state of mind and branching out with what is to come with his somewhat low-key transformation back into the man he was 20 years ago, if you can ever get back to that place. As Neil Druckmann said in the behind the scenes of this episode, Bill specifically mentions Tess in that letter and it's a reminder of Joel's failure. He's already failed to save his daughter and he's failed to save his romantic partner, if you will. What's next? Is is he gonna also allow himself to fail Ellie? No, he, he's not gonna let that happen again, but he's gonna have even more of a reason to not let that happen as he starts to care for Ellie more and more as these episodes unfold. And I know, I'm already jumping to that letter already, but since we're on the topic, I do feel like that offers a foreshadowing to a certain scene that we've already seen in a promo, and don't worry to anyone who hasn't even experienced the game, I'm not gonna give anything away. But when Bill says, we have a job to do, that's why men like me and you are here, and God help any people who stand in our way. And that's all with regards to protecting people and, and, and how Bill protected Frank. And he was talking about protecting Tess here, but the person who's left is Ellie. And God help anyone who gets in Joel's way, you know what I'm on about with regards to basically the near ending of the game. And, and I like how in that letter, it kind of sets up for that moment. From what we did get of Joel and Ellie on the road, I did enjoy it. We had them go to a store where Joel has stashed some stuff. But the interesting thing is when Ellie goes down the trap door and she finds an infected down there. Now Ellie kills this infected, but before she does that, she does stare at him for a long while. And I feel like this is a nice callback to that conversation that Ellie had with Joel or asking him, did you ever feel bad about killing them, knowing that they were once people? So I would like to think that this is her looking at a full-on cordyceps infected person, realizing that they were a person, because clearly, hey, it's a human, albeit infected. And in those moments, she's kind of looking at him, and then you see that moment where she cuts into him. I'd like to think that's symbolic, and granted, I'm probably not showing that on screen because YouTube is mega strict with monetization these days. Underneath that cut, you could see the fungally, like truly, underneath the skin, I would like to think it's symbolic for underneath the person, all that's left. You see the white cordycepsy fungly stuff there. And that's when she finally, I suppose, puts the infected person out of his misery. And it's a bit of a dawning moment for Ellie with regards to even though she's had the answer from Joel with him saying, yeah, sometimes that ultimately this is a more real answer for her. I'm still really enjoying Bella Ramsey and the, you know, slowly building up dynamic between Joel and Ellie here. She, she gives off the very inquisitive Ellie nature because Ellie, you know, is very new to a lot of things. Like, it's like, oh, that, there's a plane. You've actually been in one of those? Or whether it's the arcade machine that she couldn't play. But however, I, I suppose one thing that was kind of hard for me to believe whilst I'm thinking about it right now is when she was in the car, that truck that Bill left behind for Joel, and she's never been in one before. She, she said it was like a spaceship which she, when she was putting on the seat belt, she was like, oh, well, but I don't know if I, this is a nitpick, but she, she's been in basically Fedra training camp ever since she was a baby. Also, it's been said specifically here. And it's kind of hard for me to believe that they've never in her Fedra school, if you will, had her ride in a car, but I guess not, I guess not. So either way though, the, the main point here is Ellie being a little noob out there in the world is just giving me Ellie vibes. And you know, I know a lot of people are still split on the Ellie casting decision and Pedro even. Uh, I, I feel like that commentary has got to come up quite frequently and relevantly so, because the more and more we get throughout these episodes, the more opportunity the show will have to show you those moments and the dynamic between the castings in the story and the cast things in the video game. And for me, I think this is going pretty damn well. Also on the road, we got a little bit of a recap for how the Cordyceps infection really made the world fall. And Joel somewhat explained to Ellie that the best guess is that Cordyceps mutated. Now, luckily, 
that can't really happen in our real world. It's a brilliant concept, but uh, you know, as specialists say, like it would take millions of years for that to even mutate. Uh, currently, right now, it's very specific to ant species and whatnot. But either way, I do love this concept, and it got in the food supply. That food supply was like distributed through certain brands that ship all around the world. So people were like literally eating cordyceps that had adapted to infect human people. So if you bought that off the store shelves on Thursday, uh, by Thursday night, Friday, you'd be feeling a bit ill. And as the day goes on, people would start getting infected and then start biting. And then that means there's other ways of transmitting the cordyceps infection. I also like how when Joel was talking about examples of food, he mentioned pancake mix. And that was one of the more sad tones to his sentence because obviously he was uh, reminded of Sarah wanting to make pancakes that breakfast on his birthday the night the outbreak started. So this is where we have Joel and Ellie go down the road. Joel initially doesn't want her to see what he was warning her about. And there's like a little pit of skulls and the camera zooms in on clearly like a baby piece of clothing and that flashes us back to the mother and the baby. And this just does show you how brutal Fedra is. These people probably weren't sick yet they're gonna get shot anyway. Why kill these people if they're not infected? As Joel said, well, the, the dead can't really get infected, so better than leaving them out there. This launched us into those September 30th, 2003 flashbacks, and I'm really enjoying the perspective of time back then. I think this is just going to be a continued thing. Obviously, a lot of it was showing Bill and Frank throughout the years up until present day 2023. But you have to think, just like last episode, the episode before that and whatnot, we're still going to see this. Like, even by the time we get to Tommy, we could see maybe what he's been doing throughout the years in small segments throughout the episode. And this is when we're introduced to Bill, because out of all the people uh, who got rounded up, very unfortunately, he knew something was up. Bill was kind of one of these survivalist people preparing for a day like this anyway. And uh, I really, really enjoyed this. It, it shows like the beginning to Bill, how he fortified everything. We get a cool little montage there. But this is where four years later, he gets another signal and that's because Frank has fallen in the hole. There's a massive difference now. So as we went over at the beginning of the video, Joel and Ellie leave that old state building after Tess was trying to hold off the Fedra guards still going after them. But as we know in this adaptation, it was actually a bunch of infected coming after the Cordyceps sent a little spooky signal to them like a mile away. So in the game with Fedra still after them, despite Tess trying to hold them off, they go into the abandoned subway. Eventually along that route after they get out of there, we have Joel get caught in one of Bill's traps. Bill springs Joel out of that, leads them to safety, and the, the main mission right is to still get the truck battery. So there is a truck battery located in a crashed vehicle in the school. The thing is in the game, Bill really doesn't want to go there because it is a very, very hot spot for infected so it's just very very likely if you went there you would you would end up not making it out with the battery but they go anyway and lo and behold the battery isn't there it's, it's missing somebody has already taken it and who was it taken by none other than frank but the thing is frank in getting that battery, ended up getting infected. Now, why would Frank go and do this? Well, in the video game, Frank couldn't stand Bill at all. Even saying in a letter to Bill that he left behind where he died, I guess you were right. Trying to leave this town will kill me, still better than spending another day with you, which couldn't like contrast Frank and Bill's end in this episode anymore. Essentially, Frank grew really tired of Bill being set in his way and his attitude and wanted more from life. And I do like how in this episode, they ever so slightly brushed on that other aspect of Frank, even though it didn't remotely get to any, you know, hate between them. For example, Frank wanting to make the street look nicer or becoming friends with people over the radio, even though he could have befriended a, a freaking raider and they could have completely taken advantage of Frank and killed them both. And in this show, Bill is a bit more amenable to Frank doing that, even though he's pretty much against Joel and Tess with a gun to them on the table when they first arrive. It still embodies that spirit of Frank, I suppose, from the game. It's just that Bill in the game really pushed Frank away and didn't allow him to yearn for a little bit more, uh, just like what he did in the show. So Frank gets out the whole Bill allows him to have a meal, have a shower and whatnot. And I, I have to think this is because Bill has been a very 
very lonely man. I, I, at the end of the day, he's like a very resourceful man, but he's he's been living in this world alone. And even though in the letter he admits that he he was actually happy when everyone went to went to crap with the cordyceps infection, he didn't care if they died. But I still think the human condition and just loneliness even got to him because there was a part of me that was thinking with how far things escalated. You know, after the shower, they they basically had a good time. If you know what I mean, I was thinking this is all in the same day. This is all in the same day. The first time he met him in the hole outside, let him in, showered, fresh clothes, uh, a home-cooked meal from Bill, and then uh, having a bit of a party in the bedroom after that. And I, I think realistically in my head, something was nagging at me that I know Bill was lonely and I'm trying to put everything into that and why he might be a little bit more trusting in this moment. But I think knowing Bill, the survivalist, I think maybe realistically he would have waited a couple of days to build up a tinsy tinsy bit more rapport between this stranger but the way it unfolds in the episode is really beautiful you know like playing the piano this vulnerability to what seems to be such a hard ass like bill connecting with frank in that way it's just i think if you zoom out of it and realize this all happened in the same like six hour period of when he first came across frank in the hole I, it's a bit harder to sell but i think i let that one slide just based through the human experience of living in the post-apocalypse with both these characters finding this uh, companionship in a world of loneliness and violence, I suppose. Because, you know, again, it's not just infected out there. There's raiders that we experience a little bit later. So this kindness here bonds them together. Going back to the kindness, I even love the scene in where Frank traded one of Bill's guns without his knowledge, but for uh, some strawberry seeds. And this is the first time they've had strawberries in arguably years. Now they've got resources, but they didn't necessarily have strawberries. So this was a really nice scene. But the nicest thing out of it is that Bill said, I was never afraid before you showed up because now Bill has something to lose. And so we cut to nighttime, we see the raiders breaking in, they're getting electrocuted, freaking burned through Bill's flamethrowers. Uh, we have Bill already outside. I, I thought it was very Bill to not have him wake up Frank. Frank was just still sleeping, but Bill was fighting them off, but he gets shot. The show kind of teases for newbies that he, he could die because he kind of passes out with his eyes open. This is where we get to 2023. They're obviously a little bit older now, and they're, they're both getting a bit gray, but but there's also been another significant change, and that is that Frank has some kind of neurodegenerative condition, maybe something like ALS. You can you can tell that he can't, he he can move, but as we have those horrible conditions out there, it affects people in different ways. Sometimes degenerative conditions like that can accelerate super fast, so you you will lose your fine motor skills and stuff like very quickly. Uh, but sometimes it can happen a bit slower, so we can still see that Frank can kind of you know eat from a spoon but he can't necessarily use his fine motor skills to open a pill packet and whatnot we don't technically know when this started it could have happened very quickly for frank it could have happened within the past couple of years and already got to this point from when he was very able-bodied to uh, struggling to use motor skills and what i find fascinating about this is is that it's it's not something i would have really thought about having a condition like that in a post-apocalyptic world. So that was a very interesting concept. But in a world like this, where you have no health care and having a horrible condition like that with, as Frank says, like for the most part, you, you can't cure this in the world before, let alone cure it now. He has got to the point of not wanting to live anymore. Again, living in the post-apocalypse where you can't have really any medication or the medication that they might be able to get, like we saw in the episode, was likely given to them by Joel and some kind of knowledge from some post-apocalyptic doctors who might have some idea of what medication could help with symptoms that Frank might be suffering with. Either way, it's absolutely unfathomable to comprehend how hard that would be to endure. Uh, so we have the heartbreaking moment where Frank, as he said, it took all night for him to get out of bed into the wheelchair by himself and that this will be the last day for him. These scenes were very touching because up until this point, you've seen these two people spend the years together. Obviously, we've had, you know, time jumps and we've seen the beauty of like the 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 way that Bill has transformed, the way that Frank has touched his life and, and just, you know, getting from there to here and seeing how heartbroken Bill is when they're having that conversation and how Frank was like, you know, we're going to go and do this. We're going to go and get married today. We're going to have a home cooked meal in the evening. Again, when you just consider for a second the changes between this 
and the story in the video game, no wonder they took this opportunity to write something like this that is so much more emotionally impactful on the audience. And so their story ends. We have, we have Bill pour out the wine, but it turns out that he'd already put enough pills in the wine to kill a horse and he drank some of that. So in a very romantic gesture, Bill feels satisfied and they went back to the bedroom, they shut the door and they both passed away, I suppose, in their sleep. And so by the time Joel and Ellie arrive, you know, they start to notice, or at least Joel would start to notice that something was wrong because they would have watered the plants and whatnot. And they go in there and they find out what has happened. Obviously, Ellie read out this letter and it was it was pretty funny with the wording that Bill left behind with regards to anyone else would have been blown up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as I said at the, towards the beginning of this video, the most significant part of that letter was with what Bill said about respecting Joel and tell him something because he's probably the only person who's going to understand. And that was how, you know, he used to hate the world as with what probably Joel understands, but he was wrong because there was one person worth saving this goes back to what Tess said as well, save who you can. There's Ellie there. Now, even though he wrote this letter about Tess, you know, we have one job to do. I leave you all my weapons and my equipment, use them to keep Tess safe, but he can use that to keep Ellie safe. And we're going to see this stiff, closed off version of Joel to a way more malleable one, but who is willing to, again, in Bill's words, God help any mother effers who, uh, and again, YouTube monetization, uh, who stand in our way. And uh, I can't wait until we get that dynamic between Joel and Ellie built up a little bit more. Now around this part, Ellie finds a gun in a drawer and puts it in a bag. This is obviously after her more or less pestering Joel that she wants a gun uh, because it would be helpful, but he's like, no, no. And you know that this gun is going to come in very handy. Joel takes this opportunity as well. Since he's got the truck, he can kill two birds with one stone. Since Tommy used to run with the fireflies as we've already been over in previous episodes, they're gonna go there, may as well, right? And maybe Tommy me can help out through knowing some other fireflies and get Ellie to wherever this lab is. And so the episode ends with the zoom out into Bill and Frank's room for a split second there. I thought, oh god, are they actually going to show that? Because I assume they died fairly recently, so the state of decomposition would have looked pretty rough. Uh, but yeah, what a fantastic episode. I really, really enjoyed this change. I think this is pretty much the example to lead by if you're gonna make adaptation changes in the show. Don't deviate in such a way that will alienate fans with regards to how that literally affects the plot down the road. A good example of this is, for example, the, the Halo show. Like, there's, there's such changes there that the changes that are made, no matter what, impact everything about that Halo lore. But with this, this is innovation to it's absolute potential. But ultimately, guys, I'm going to love and leave you. I just want to know what you thought of this episode. Did you enjoy the adaptation of this part of the game with Bill and Frank? Did you think it was a nice innovation or did you absolutely hate it? Uh, just let me know any and all thoughts. Let me know overall what you're thinking of The Last of Us on HBO Max 3 episodes in. Granted that we've got quite a ways to go yet. Really interested to hear your takes. Please leave a like on this video if you did enjoy it. Do consider subscribing for weekly breaks breakdowns just like this and all kinds of other content on the channel from news reviews and breakdowns but until next time guys thank you so much for watching i hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you all in the next video goodbye